Now, having dealt with uh, painting in terms of understanding that all art is abstract and that a picture is nothing more than a pattern and that readability is its prime concern, and we've considered three conditions of lighting, which gives us a clue to control of color in uh, dealing in landscape. Now we come to one last consideration, and that has to do with line. And when we, d when we could discuss line, we go full circle in our argument, because in the very beginning, we said all art is abstract. And when we deal with line, we deal with a pure abstraction. We're back to abstraction, even in the device that we use for rendering. Now, you could make a drawing of this box. I don't know what this is. This is a rectangular object. The dictionary will tell you that, uh, that a line is the intersection of two planes. You have one plane going across the top of the box, you have one plane going to the side of it. That's the intersection of planes. So a line could be indicated as a, a way of, of describing the edge of that box. That's the intersection of the planes. But the catch is there's no line there. It's merely, the line is merely a device by which you indicate that corner, or it's a convention. It's an abstraction. When you deal with line, you're dealing with something that does not exist in reality, but is a tool by which you can delineate shapes. You can create the illusion of three dimension by the use of uh, perspective. And uh, you can use line to give direction through your painting. And you can uh, use line in ways in which to indicate texture, the roughness of bark on a tree, or the if you want to indicate that the wall is made up of a building, is made up of boards nailed together, then it would be foolish. You have two planes butted together, but who can talk about planes at that scale? All you can do is use a line to represent the vision between boards. Or you look up into a tree, a bare branch tree, and you see all these this matrix of small twigs. Those twigs are round cylindrical entities. But at that scale, all you can do is just indicate with a line. Or you have a tele telegraph line or a, a railroad track or whatever. You use the line as a symbol representing, merely representing uh, edges and shapes. But the line itself does not exist. So even not only in our uh, concept of, of uh, form do we deal in abstraction, but in the actual tool by which we, we uh, render our pictures, we deal in abstraction. Now, I've been talking steadily for the last uh, 30 minutes at least, and it would seem to be a kind of a an attitude to say that I feel we've summed up all of the most and definitely basic things having to do with painting structure. But I believe that if you will, uh, if you have made notes or you will make notes and you study them and think them over carefully, you would come to realize that we have literally dealt with everything that is basically pertinent to painting. Beyond this, it's simply a matter of uh, all the other aspects, the development of skills in rendering, the development of uh, skill in handling your medium, understanding of your medium and, and its various characteristics, uh, understanding the importance of uh, permanent colors, sound base on which to develop a painting and all those other things. But from the theoretical point of view, if you will concentrate I believe that you would agree, or would come to agree, that from the few basic principles that we've dealt with in this argument, in this discussion, we have summed up all those things that are fully and permanently and definitely 
uh, pertinent to painting. Style of painting, uh, schools of painting, techniques of painting, all these things are fall in their own, uh, to their own degree of importance, but the important thing really is un the understanding of these fundamentals that we have just been discussing. Uh, so I'll thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions about the things we've been saying? Yeah. I, uh, I have uh, in the past, in, the, in my in the beginnings, I worked only in oil, and then as I associated with other painters, I got into the business of painting watercolors as well. And before the war, we all, all of our group would exhibit watercolors and oils with e equal uh, uh, enthusiasm, and but. During the war, I went overseas as a, as a War Department artist. I carried watercolors because they were expedient and easy to carry and uh, work with. And when I came home, after I came home, busy making a living, teaching or working in the studios, if I got a chance to take a few days vacation to paint, I would take my watercolors for the same reasons that I did during the war. And eventually I became known for watercolor painting more than for my oil painting. And uh, the circumstance well, is, it seems, if you get to painting watercolors, some way you feel, have the feeling you're never licking this medium. And it's hardly a sportsman like to leave it unfinished. And uh, and you get a, a rather arrogant attitude which has no basis for a reason at all, and that is anyone can do it in oil, who can do it in watercolor. You do, you get a little arrogant in that way. You, uh, we have, we're criticized, I think watercolors are more or less still considered the orphans in this business of the painting world, and oil painting is still the permanent solid uh, medium. But we're, again, we're arrogant and we assume that you need to know how to paint, whether you work in oil or watercolor or acrylic, but if you're painting watercolors, you have to know how to paint right now. The, uh, this isn't a sound argument at all. And uh, I thank you, if I understood you, I have come back I am adventuring into oil painting again. I haven't painted in oil for years. It was kind of a, a challenge. Uh, Mr. Anderson, who handles my pictures, has has continually asked me during the last year if I wouldn't uh, be interested in point painting oils. Well, I haven't responded. I, I seldom respond to any suggestion that I do something uh, that, uh, where the work implied. The, uh, but he brought a canvas on a beautiful stretcher, 52 inches by 72 inches, and he said, I'll pay you $1,000 if you paint the picture. I'm not gonna, that isn't to buy it, I'll just pay you for doing it, and then after it's done, if it's any good, well then we'll, I'll be your dealer and we'll try to sell the picture. So when, when there was money in sight, I uh, got busy, and, uh, and I'm getting quite a thrill trying to get back into oil painting. And certainly I'm facing the fact that there's every bit as much challenge as there could possibly be in the painting of watercolors. So to answer your question, I may be headed back into oil painting and possibly get very enthusiastic about it. I hope so. Any other question? Yeah. Discover a line or uh, isolate a line that will in its single simplicity, divide the picture vertically, and that line will, in its character, have, have a certain aspect which will characterize, in a certain way, the whole 
rhythm of the rhythm of the picture, and and the hope is that I can then relate every other line to that basic storytelling line. I look upon that as the theme line. So, in uh, with that in mind, I'm going to the first move now is to find one line down through the picture the page vertically, which will more or less sum up the suggestion for the whole whole picture. And at the same time, I'm going to try to handle this brush in such a way as to have some sensitivity of line. And uh, so that when I come back with further refinements, I will not have dealt with things that are in the way of my final development. Now, if I was a, an abstract painter, I might paint this area black, leave this white, and uh, send it to a show, and, and I'd say the uh, show ashore at Kona. And people wonder where I got such an idea or what painters think about. But I know where I got that line. It was based upon the thought that uh, a predominant uh, item in the scene is a palm tree. And in that gesture of the trunk of the palm tree and the suggestion of further development of palm fronds and, and plant forms in the foreground, I have a framework by, in relation to which I can present all the rest of the picture. Now, so I have two areas. We spoke, I spoke this morning about a picture being a story told in terms of shapes. So let's just say we see what we can come with coming back horizontally. Now we have one, two, three, four shapes. I could paint them yellow, orange, black, and red and go home. Assuming that I've been sensitive enough to uh, create four different shapes that could go together to sur survive or serve as a, an abstract uh, hard edge composition. But I'm still a traditional painter to a certain extent, and uh, this all this uh, maneuver of uh, uh, isolating shapes is for two reasons. First of all, to exemplify for my audience the, uh, the thinking process, and the second is to uh, divide this paper into its biggest division first, and then follow with the minor details. So we'll just keep on dividing here. And I've already given away the fact that I possibly <coughs> that I've recently been in Hawaii and uh, had the experience of going back to a, a park down below the village at Kona where there's been the attempt to uh, recreate some atmosphere of old Hawaii. So I'm indulging myself in a little of the romance of, the, of old Hawaii.
Now we can begin to complete. We, we're getting one area after another. We might uh, make a few more broad divisions. One time I was painting in Monterosso, Italy. I had the picture uh, in its first stages of washes. An old German lady, a tourist, came along and she watched me and she said, Stop! And I, I stopped, rather startled and uh, listened, and then I started to touch the thing again. She said, I said, stop. <laughs> so she was, she was going to be around there for a while, and I was getting to be afraid of her. <laughs> so, so I stopped and packed up, and a, a friend of mine in Anaheim owns the picture. I saw it not too long, and I told her that story, of course. And uh, here we looked at this somewhat, what I might have considered at one time an unfinished watercolor, but now it seems fresh and, uh, and uh, alive simply because it wasn't uh, painted to death. And she said, I'm glad the old lady made you stop on that. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you do, in your painting experience, have the music experience with the people you meet. In travel, I've discovered that if you just find a location in, to paint and stay there, work on pictures. People come to you, they tell you all about things in the, around, they alert you to the things that should be seen, and um, they uh, orient you to, the, to really knowing about the place, and you get acquainted simply. You're a fellow working there on the street, and they, and they um, sympathize with you. I've had, I had a wonderful compliment in Ireland one, one afternoon. I was painting in Limerick, looking across the Shannon River to St. John's Castle. It was a bleak, cold afternoon. I wasn't too happy about the way my picture was going. I was about ready to pack up. An old lady came across the street with a tray of tea and cakes, and she said, I've been watching you. You've been here all afternoon. You haven't even had tea. So we sat and drank tea and ate the cakes and talked about things. and. She looked down at my picture that I didn't think much of, and she gave a great sigh, and she says, All my life I've known that this dirty old river was beautiful, and now with God's help you've proven it. <laughs> that was one of the best compliments I've ever had. <laughs> and the Irish people walk by, and, you're, and you will be at work, and they say, God bless your hands.